Ladies and gentlemen, and one of Cote's closest friends, Mr. Robert Woodson. It's a tough task to have just come in a storm just a few weeks ago to honor him. And Bob said to me, oh, I don't think anybody's going to be there. And the place was packed. And that's a testament to the love that Bob inspired with all of us. Well, I met him when I, uh, I guess 20 years ago, when I was going around the country to deepen my understanding of why and how grassroots people are effective. And I came to Denver, and I met Bob right after he had told me the story of taking a man who was drunk on the street and whose cheek was frozen to the sidewalk and how many hours it took them to, to, uh, to, to free him. And he said this with absolute passion. Usually when you say about somebody that's single-minded, you think they're narrow-minded. But Bob never talked sports, he never talked women, he never talked anything. It was just his passion for salvaging the lives of people. I want to just touch on briefly the implications that he had for national policy because after all, when I met Bob, he described the center that I started 33 years ago. We've trained uh, 2,500 people in 39 states and Bob was one of the first to go through the training. And Bob described our organization as a Geiger counter that goes around into low-income neighborhoods and looks for people who are achieving against the odds, and once we find them, we put miracle grow in the form of training and access to capital. I use that to this day as a shorthand description of what we do. But Bob, when I asked him to come and we, we met at, before the Senate, it was the only time that anyone allowed people, to, for poor people to speak for themselves. And Bob was a powerful witness, both before the Senate and the House, and then we got an invitation to go to the White House, and we shared there. Bob is operating between two great forces in society. One is the powerful government approach that has spent $15 trillion in the last 50 years, and that approach says to poor people, you are too uh, impotent to care for yourself. Let, let us care for you. And everything is imposed on it. Bob understood that this, if somebody can lead you into the forest, they can lead you back out. And so Bob understood that, that the oppressive hand of government compels people to do things that are hostile to their own interest. And so that the same, he understood that the same hand that glorifies can also crucify. And then he was uh, had to confront with another uh, 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 challenge on the right of my good libertarian conservative friends who believe that all we must do is just you know open the doors of the free enterprise system and let the let, let the strongest survive. They don't understand what Bob is that expectation in the absence of opportunity is oppression. If you really want to somebody to be helped, then you must be the agent of their transformation. So Bob, because of he is a person of character, understood that what poor people need is not an advocate, but a witness. And a, because he was a man of character that took them by the hand and led them into this new uh, sense of responsibility. And so Bob Cote, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot, it's fine to come here and talk glowingly about his past. But if we really are serious about preserving his legacy, then we will commit ourselves to go through every one of the boxes that he has with all of his speeches, the, the videos, the testimonies from individuals. It needs to be captured in a book. It needs, to, we need to develop a Bob Cote curriculum. If he were some famous scientist, there'd be an institution with his name on it and some of the great colleges and universities will establish a Bob Cote Institute where we would collect all of his papers and take them to the Library of Congress and, and go through them and pay scholars to go through. This is what we've got to do to Bob Cote's legacy, not just come here in this fine place and say something about what he did and then go home. 
that we must commit ourselves to take the lessons that Bob taught us through his life, study them, write about them, let journals be written about them, let scholars come and study these principles so that America can be guided to a better future than we're pursuing now. We will not address the problems of poor people by having this gladiatorial combat that masquerades as debate. The real solutions to the problem of America's poor abides in the experiences of a Bob Cote. And therefore, he is the ultimate expert in the reduction of poverty in America. And we must go through everything that he has written, every word that he has spoken, every piece of testimony that he's given, every interview that he's had. We must take in those videos and listen and learn firsthand what is it that causes Bob to challenge people that psychiatrists couldn't reach, pastors couldn't reach. But he instilled in people a sense of their own power. That poor people, if, if, if change is to be lasting, Bob understood that people must be agents of their own transformation. And I, change, I, I challenge my conservative colleagues, who I, I describe as public policy medical examiners who keep feeding us autopsy reports about poor people, how many are on drugs, how many in jail, and how many are not married, and how many lives are doomed to failure. Well, that's a study of crucifixion. Even Jesus didn't hang around the cross. We must study Bob Cote's type of resurrection. We need redemption studies. We need scholars coming to Step 13 and interviewing people who have been through the program 15 years ago, 10 years ago, to find out where they are now and where they would have been if they had not come to Step 13. That's how we preserve the legacy of Bob Cote and not just in giving speeches and showing videos of what he did. The importance of this man's contributions to the national debate over how best to address poverty cannot die with him. He is too important and his legacy is too essential to us moving forward in addressing the needs of the least of God's children. Let me just conclude with a personal note about Bob. Ten years ago, I lost my son to death. He was about Sherry's age. And so I called Bob when I knew that he had lost his daughter. And we walked together through that pain because I told him how I got through it. And Bob and I commiserated with one another. So we were kindred spirits. And Bob's friendship will last a lifetime with me. And when I think of Bob, I think of this passage. And that is, first of all, mediocrity never arouses intense hatred. So if somebody is firing at you, it means that you are in the fight. And Bob is in the fight. But Bob also understands, and his legacy to us is, that if your vision is clear and your principle exact, people will always know where to find you. Like a lighthouse that remains constantly fixed in one place with its light shining. The fog of prejudice, self-doubt, greed, enmity may keep them from seeing you, but if you remain as a moral and spiritual lighthouse, those who are lost will find you, and America must return to this purpose. And God, Bob Cote is the person to continue this struggle even in his death. And let me just say, my friend Bob, I know you're looking down and participating. You have run the race. Now go and claim your prize. And rest well, my friend. Rest well. Listen to the old man Listen to the old man Listen to the old man When 
you can.